Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual edition of our year-round member screening series, Film Independent Presents. My name is Alexander Greer, and I am a documentary alumni of Film Independence Los Angeles Film Festival. Um, and before we get started, I want to give a special mention to some of Film Independence loyal supporters. Thank you to our incredible lead sponsor, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, our virtual screening partner, Vision Media, and our official media partner, the Los Angeles Times, and promotional partner, KCRW. For anybody that hasn't seen it yet, uh, well, first, like, stop and go watch it immediately because this is an excellent film, and I'm really excited to talk with these two directors. Um, Class Action Park is what we're here to talk about today, which uh, tells the story of one of the most notorious and infamous theme parks to ever exist, whose danger, excess, and reckless abandon for the public good was matched only by the era in which it was manifested, which was 1980s United States of America. Uh, it's available to stream right now on HBO Max, and I'm here today with the film's co-directors, Seth Porges and Ch Chris Charles Scott III. I'm always interested to, to know what's going on in people's backgrounds. Where are you guys Zooming from this day? Chris, where are you? I am in Bisbee, Arizona. Yeah, beautiful Bisbee, Arizona. Cool. <laughs> beautiful Bisbee, Arizona. Very beautiful artist community here, uh, former minor mining town. Down here doing some filming and hanging out with friends who actually own a hotel here. So I'm in Bisbee. By coincidence, friends of mine as well, but we didn't realize this until like four days ago. So. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I'm up in uh, Beacon, New York. Oh, fun. Yeah, you got a much more minimalist atmosphere going on than, than, than Chris does in the background there. Chris, you got a lot of good tchotchkes, it looks like. I am in my friend's tchotchke store, Object Limited, 29 Main Street, Bisbee, Arizona. It is literally a tchotchke store, so yeah. <laughs> good, good, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good with the verbiage, apparently. <laughs> um, so with any documentary, uh, it's, it's, it's always a long and storied road from finding something that you want to tell a story about to actually having it, uh, you know, be available to watch. And uh, I mean, wow, is it available to watch? It's on HBO Max, excellent platform. And I was looking, you guys got a uh, hundred percent sitting on Rotten Tomatoes right now, which must feel really excellent and quite the accomplishment. Uh, so at this point in the road, I wanted to invite you guys to look back and tell me how, how you came across this story or how you decided that you wanted to tell this story and how you got it to this place that we're at today. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. So I've been immersed in the world of Action Park, absolutely obsessed with this story uh, for pretty much my whole life. You know, I went to Action Park as a kid and anybody who goes to Action Park sort of comes away with very strange experiences, very strange memories. And, you know, I grew up going to all sorts of amusement parks and theme parks, Universal Studios, Disney, Six Flags, whatever. And it's very clear from the moment you walk up to Action Park, the Action Park is very different from all of those. What I like to say is when you walk up to Disneyland, the first thing you see is like a big castle. When you walk up to Action Park, first thing you see is a giant loop-de-loop -loop water slide. It's at the gate. It's like taunting you. It's a symbol telling you everything here is weird. The rules of, of God and man don't apply here. This is a very different and strange place. But I went there as a very young kid and only a couple of times. So I had these memories of crazy looping water slides and just like bodies flopping around and fights breaking out and violence and blood and all of these things that as I got older didn't square with my idea of how society works, how, how the world functions. There's no way that was real. And so I began to sort of doubt my own memories. Maybe that was something I saw on TV. Maybe that was like a Looney Tunes cartoon that sort of seeped in, right? And as I got older, I started looking into the topic of Action Park and finding most of what was out there on the internet was you know a couple of weird New Jersey articles, a thinly, thinly sourced Wikipedia page, a lot of myth, a lot of legend, very little in terms of, of journalism, of fact, of interview, of, of, of the things that I as a journalist kind of look to. And I started becoming very interested in sort of digging into this topic to effectively fact check my own memories, but also to see what of, of the greater legend, of the greater myth of Action Park was actually true. Um, and so I started writing articles about it and giving lectures on it in like 2008 or 2009. Uh, in 2013, I worked on a, a documentary short on the topic with my friends, uh, Matt and Anthony, uh, that ended up going quite viral. 
And that was really amazing because I think that was the first time that you know, it, it went viral, I think, for a very specific reason. And that's that a lot of people from New Jersey had a similar experience as I did, which was they would tell people these stories, these memories, these, these things they'd encountered at Action Park, and people wouldn't believe them because it sounds like a bunch of dudes from New Jersey just making stuff up, you know? It's like, oh, yeah, I went down this water slide. And I'm like, who believes that guy, you know? <laughs> and so we did this, and we, we actually interviewed people who were close to sort of upper levels of management at the park, and they effectively confirmed a lot of these rumors. And so people from New Jersey start passing this video around as basically validation, as proof, like to their spouses saying, see, I wasn't lying. You know, so it became like, this, this, it went very viral in, in that sense. And something amazing happened after we released that. And that's my inbox just started getting messages from people who worked at the park or went to the park who basically said something along the lines of, you're just scratching the surface. I saw things. There's so much more, so much more. And I started getting these stories and collecting these stories, not really sure what I would end up doing with them, talking to people and really kind of piecing together what the larger story was here. And then uh, early last year, I was visiting my good friend, Chris Charles Scott in Las Vegas, uh, my wonderful friend, wonderful filmmaker. And we were just getting a drink and we were talking. And Chris basically is like, why haven't you done anything bigger with all this action park stuff you've collected. And really it was like right then and there, we said, we're doing it, we're doing it. Uh, and that was April of 2019. Chris, oh, Chris you're, you're muted. Uh, and by Memorial Day uh, 2019, we were in New Jersey filming. Yeah. yeah, just like two months later, camera's rolling. What a absolutely quick turnaround, uh, yeah. especially because I'm, I'm going to jump questions here, uh, but like one of the things that really struck me about this um, was the style in which you told it, which obviously when you're doing a story on anything that happened in the past, you have to rely on archival footage. Um, and you guys just had like a treasure trove of what seemed to be home movies. Yeah. Like I'm assuming those were, were those just home movies sourced from people. Absolutely. Put that signal up and people send them to you. You know, it was, it was really as simple as us finding people, you know, so you'd find somebody on YouTube and put up like a snippet of their home movie footage. You try to reverse engineer their contact information from their username. You'd reach out to them and then they'd say, oh, I've actually got two hours of this stuff. You know, it would be stuff like that. And so it was a lot of detective work, a lot of investigative work, a lot of just throwing it out there to the world. Like I kind of became sort of known in the action park world because of my earlier short, some of the articles I'd done. So I had people reaching out to me who were just kind of, here's our home movies. So yeah, ton of home movies, ton of home movies, some old action park ads. There's that great episode of Headbangers Ball that we, we feature. Um, but yeah, mostly just people's home movies. I, I just was like, what, go ahead. I was often with a guy in uh, Prim, Nevada and he had just a random dude, he goes, what do you do? I said, I make documentaries. He goes, what are you working on? So I work on this documentary about a water park in New Jersey, Action Park. He goes, oh my God, I grew up going to Action Park and my mother has VHSs in her garage. Um, so we could not get away from, from Action Park and the influence. And these people would reach out to us. There was one guy who reached out over Facebook goes, I have footage. And by that evening, he'd had it digitized and sent to us. And so the Action Park contingents, I mean, the, the, the constituents who went to Action Park, they're ready for this movie. Yeah. <laughs> so. that's, that's one of the coolest elements of making a documentary is that when you decide to tell a story about something that affected so many people, you end up getting connected with all of those affected people Absolutely. and you kind of share in this moment. Absolutely. But also like getting all these people's home movies puts you guys in a uniquely privileged position. I'm just imagining, I'm imagining you guys making this movie. I'm imagining you in the edit bay, like logging footage and going through people's, I'm going through people's personal home movies. And I can only imagine some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor because it was totally irrelevant to the story. But do you guys remember any like particularly weird stuff that you took out from these home movies? I think by the time it ended up in our inbox, they had kind of done, they had removed the their birthday parties and their bar mitzvahs ah. and their weddings <laughs> from it. But maybe, I, maybe I'm missing some anecdotes. <laughs> well, I mean, that's awesome. Um, uh, let's see. So in grouping together like this entire shared nostalgia, I mean, and like you said, Seth, like you were, you were trying to factualize something that you had maybe forgotten or you maybe had misremembered or you thought that might not have been real. Um, 
in doing that, you guys make some pretty big and interesting cultural insights. Um, I, I mean, you, you, you expand the scope from, from being just a story about a crazy water park to being a story about uh, an era uh, and a culture and uh, an ethos that has uh, largely, as you say, faded. Um, and I couldn't tell by the end of the movie if you guys were uh, nostalgic and in want of that or if you were happy that we've moved on from, from that sort of uh, existence. I was wondering if you could talk more on that. I think that confusion is exactly the point. You know, I think this, this movie is somewhat, I don't want to, you know, it's been challenging for some people, I think, because they want to be told what to think. Uh, they want to say, like, was this guy a good by, guy or bad guy? Was this park a good thing or a bad thing? Were the 80s a good thing or a bad thing? And we're, this isn't the movie, kind of movie where we come out and we, you know, have a political point of view or strong anything. We want to tell you things. We want to tell you how it was. And I think different people walk away from it with different in interpretations, honestly. But I think if you're gonna say, like, what is this movie really about in that sense? It's about the duality, about both those things can exist. I mean, our interview subject, uh, Chris Gather, put it so brilliantly at the end of the movie when he kind of talks about how people from this generation can simultaneously look back at these things they experience as children and be so grateful that they had the opportunity to grow up that way with that freedom and those experiences and simultaneously be absolutely furious that that's how they had to grow up. And how nostalgia can both be something where you look back at it fondly because that was your childhood, but at the same time, you know it was kind of messed up. And I think both those things can coexist. And that's what Action Park was. It was this place where for some people, it was the most fun, amazing, joyous place in the world. And then for others, it was a place of immense heartache and tragedy. And it could have been that for both those things for one person with one minute being one and then the next minute being the other. And that's really what, to me, at least the movie was about. And Chris, what do you think? When we dug into this movie and I started figuring out about Gene Marvel Hill, I wanted Gene to be the bad guy so badly. I needed for him to be my villain. But as I began to get to know Gene through the interviews and through the articles, I, there was this, this, I don't know, this love affair with Gene. I liked Gene. I understood Gene. Um, and so Gene to me was not my villain. I wanted to present the 80s as a possible villain, uh, the type of parenting, the latchkey kids of the 1980s, where you climbed trees and you woke up in the morning and you hung out with your friends all day, building tree houses and having clubs and your parents weren't even looking for you. And it's so representative of the time that we live in now where we're having to isolate and we're so fearful of the outside and neighbors and disease and pandemic. The 80s were like complete opposite of that. Like we took, I took myself back to a time, I grew up in a town of 533 people on the Texas-Louisiana border. We didn't have an action park, but we had cliffs that we jumped off of in the lake. We had, we tried to die for fun. And my cousin, after he watched the movie, he goes, man, this was our childhood. And I was like, exactly. Um, and so, how you interpret this movie, I guess, is about the time and the place that you grew up. My brother is 32. I'm 39. He watched the documentary and couldn't understand it. I mean, just mm -hmm. that few years behind me, because he didn't grow up that way. He grew up with the Nintendos and the Playstations, and he doesn't have friends that he hung out with and went to their houses. And so I guess it's about the time or place that you grew up in is how you conclude the movie. Did you guys go into it with that intention? Because one of the really things that's interesting about the structure of the movie is I feel like um, it starts off so whimsical and so fun and absurd. Um, and then it takes a really sharp, turn into something real and dangerous and, and difficult. And it's, it's kind of like what I'm assuming riding a ride at Action Park would, would be like, fun at first and then a horrible turn. Or visiting the park. Uh, it's fun and it's whimsical. Uh, it's, it's, it's a coming of age place for a lot of young men in the New Jersey era. But it did hurt people. It did name people. And so the, 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 the very, the very vibe of the movie reflected the energy that people look back on the park or, or, 
or the energy of the park while it existed. It's fun, it's whimsical, but you can show up looking to just splash around a wave pool and end up dying. That was a real option at Action Park. Yeah, the, the, the sharp turn in the movie, I think, is, is crucial. Crucial. And, and I think it's really interesting seeing people's responses to it because like, you see words in like reviews where people say like it made them feel uncomfortable or something like that. And I just say, good. That is exactly <laughs> the idea of this movie. This is a movie I, I told Chris, uh, I was like, I want to make a movie where people laugh and then hate themselves for laughing. Mm. And because Action Park, the myth, the legend of Action Park has become a joke. And it's not a joke because there's like, here's something funny, here's a punchline. It's a joke because it's so absurd. The mere existence of it is funny. The laughter you get from a looking and reading about Plastic Action Park is very different from like, say, seeing a stand-up comic or, or a comedy show. You're just shaking your head because in laughter is the only emotion that, the only expression that, that can tell, tell that story. And because of that, Action Park has itself become somewhat of a joke. This absurd relic of another time, but boy, didn't that sound fun. And I thought it was really important for us to lean into that myth and to show that what that myth was and, and to make people who may not be familiar with the myth understand the myth and the legend and the excitement and like the giddiness that people have with Action Park and then totally tear it down as quickly as possible. I mean, and again, it's like if you are on an alpine slide, you might be having the best time of your life and then five seconds later, you're having the worst time of your life. And the distance between that is not telegraphed in a traditional movie structure. It's not, you know, there's, you're not foreshadowing that's going to happen. It happens instantly, it happens suddenly. And we wanted to turn in the movie to be as close to reflecting that as possible, even if, and maybe even especially if it made people feel uncomfortable. Because if you're going to laugh at action, we want to give people permission to laugh. Like the first hour of the movie is funny. It's funny. And we want, and you're allowed to laugh. We want people to laugh. We want to make people laugh, but then we want them to understand what they were laughing at and basically say, if you want to give yourself permission to laugh about this, you need to know what you're laughing at. And you guys executed that masterfully. I mean, it's what, it's what elevates it from a, a, a short about a, a, an oddity to you know, a biting cultural examination, which is what I'd say the movie is. Did you, did you know that that was what you wanted to do with it going into this story? Or was that a conclusion that was only arrived at after sitting and reflecting and marinating in what you were looking at for so long? So I want to hear Chris's thoughts on this, but for me, the moment when I think I realized that was after we had the interview with Esther Larson. Yes. Because um, yeah. up until that point, I think we were both still drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit. I think we were both sort of reveling in the, in the getting nostalgia of Action Park and laughing about it and viewing it as nothing but a joke and not really giving proper examination to the human toll, the human toll of this place and the people actually got hurt and people actually got killed. But once we were in a room with the Larson family, it was impossible not to see that. It was impossible. And the juxtaposition between the interview with the Larsons and some of the other interviews we had was so astonishing to us and magnified both. You know, the Larson interview was so tragic and heartfelt to us because we'd already interviewed people who had nothing but nice things to say about the park. And I wanted viewers to go through that same transformation that we did, where we are laughing and joking with people about Action Park, and then it just comes right down to earth. Chris, what do you think? The Larson's interview, Seth nailed it. That was a turning point for us. We had not interviewed someone who had had a family member maimed seriously or, or, or killed at the park. And after the Larson's interview, that was the turning point for me. You want to talk on how you guys came across the Larson's, how that, how that became a part of, of the story from a production standpoint? Yes, yeah, so Seth and I, we were going over our interview list and we were like, we need a lifeguard, we need the, a security guy, we need a patron, we need a, and going down the catalog of people that we needed to do this, we, said, let's find someone who was seriously hurt or had a family member hurt at the park. We had no idea that the Larsons were still alive, if they were in New Jersey. And so I said, let's look up their family. Because any other action park articles or, or news stories about the park, we did not see the Larsons mentioned or any family of a person killed at the park. And so we were like, maybe these people don't exist. Maybe people have tried. We could not believe that no one had reached out. And so I Googled George Larson and an obituary came up 
and it was George Lawson Jr.'s dad, George Lawson Sr. And he had passed away and uh, it said that he owned a construction company in the Orlando area. We went to that website, wrote, I wrote, hey, I'm Chris Scott, I'm doing a documentary on Action Park in their contact us section. About 15 minutes later, we get a call. A guy is sobbing on the phone. Um, I cannot understand a word he's saying. And he's like, give me a minute, give me a minute, give me a minute, give me a minute. And it was Brian Larson, the brother. And he said, we've been waiting on this call for nearly 40 years. Nobody had ever reached out to them. Every mile. Not yeah. one. In addition, and it's not like there's a shortage of people who've written about Action Park, myself included. Um, but nobody ever reached out to them. And what's amazing is that the Larson death, it's mentioned frequently in articles about Action Park as one of the deaths uh, in oral histories and whatnot. It, it's, it's mentioned. But the facts that are out there are wrong. They're just wrong. And we realized that the, the story of the Larson death was one that had been somewhat constructed in order to make it seem like, so one, one of the myths of Action Park was that this was this incredible joy land. Uh, we're gonna give you all the tools at the best time of your life. And if you get hurt, it's because you did something wrong. We're not gonna stop you. You do something wrong, get hurt, that's your fault. Mm -hmm. So the story of the Larsons was that he was an employee at the park, operating these rides at night, uh, racing friends in the rain in the pitch black. And none of that's true. He wasn't an employee of the park. He had previously operated a ski lift at the sister resort, uh, ski resort in a previous season, but they never reported his death to the state is what we realized. And they never reported that to the state because basically they realized they could claim he was a park employee because he had worked at the sister ski resort. That was their dubious explanation the state didn't buy. Uh, so it was kind of two things. One was they never reported his death to the state. The other was they were building up this myth and the story that it was his fault. And that was, that was just astonishing to me because I see like, you know, media bought into it. the media yeah. bought into it. Yeah. It seemed like legitimate, like main, mainstream news articles very recently, like in the past couple of months talking about this. And it's always a, par a park employee, action park employee, action park employee. It wasn't an action park employee. Yeah. The, 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 the litigious uh, sidestepping that Mulva Hill seemed to do makes him difficult to feel good for by the time the movie's over. I mean, you guys do kind of a really good picture of him as this like uh, larger than life creator and you do feel sympathy for him. But yeah, it does take that turn. Yeah, um, a lot of people, they, one of the things I've seen people like that frustrates people, and again, this movie's supposed to be frustrating, is that I think people want us to kind of have that moralizing, like he was a bad, bad man. And if you walk away from this movie feeling that way, that's absolutely fine. But we're, we're, journalists we're not gonna it's not an op-ed you know like we're telling you things that happened and you know some of the people we interviewed about gene they had very bad things to say about him and they had some good things to say about him and they basically told us like if you only edit our interview to include the bad things you're lying you're just lying and i think we had a real responsibility to you know make these humans humans good people bad people they're humans they have dimensions to them and i'm i'm drawn to complex characters. I don't think it's fair to anybody. I think it's overly simplistic to simply say he's like the Joker, you know, he's some like cartoon villain. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys did a great job of making me not know how to feel at the end of this, but definitely feeling something. Um, I'm curious, I, I wanna move into talking about your guys' uh, working relationship, uh, your co-directors. Um, do you both have a background in journalism? No, so <laughs> I've known Chris for, uh, almost a decade now. And, you know, it's actually, he worked in PR at the time and I was a journalist, that's what it was. But, uh, you know, but, but Chris moved into becoming a documentary filmmaker and I had done some work on like web videos and, and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, I was the, I had the story and I needed, I needed a partner to execute it. And Chris was the, Chris was my man. Um, mm -hmm. And so it really was, it was an awesome working relationship because I was able to learn so much from Chris about the filmmaking process. And I think, at least I hope, he learned from me a little bit about the journalism process and we're able to sort of combine forces and really, I think, fill in each other's gaps in a, in a big, big way. Um, you know, I, I knew the story. I knew the story. I had, I had the sources. I had the material. I had everything. I needed the ability to put it on celluloid. And Chris was my, my executor that did it so, so, so beautifully. And I mean, the, the, the partnership uh, was unique because there were things that Seth fought for. And I was like, you know, I just don't get that. I, I, I don't get that, but I'm gonna trust you, Seth, on this. 
And there were things that I fought for. Then Seth was like, I'm going to trust you on that. And it's been reflected in the reviews that we've been getting and that have commented on the different aspects that we both fought for. They're saying that, oh, I'm glad they did this. I'm glad they did that. And so a lot of uh, looking back on it was like, wow, Seth, okay, I apologize. You were right. Um, I'm, curious, I'm sorry. No, it, it, really, it kind of reminds me of, you know, I, I really don't mean to give us this much credit or, or put us on this pedestal. But if you look at like some of the more interesting creative partnerships out there, like The Clash, you got Joe Strummer and you got Mick Jones, or uh, like The Beatles, McCartney and Light. I mean, we're not those guys, clearly. But you know, they, you, some of the great music, like you can sort of hear the tension or, you know, like see what each person brought to the table. Like, uh, you know, a day in the life, the Beatles song. Oh, there's a McCartney part. Here's the Lennon part. They brought something together. And I think what made this movie work, like was this really strange alchemy where these things that I thought were important about the story met the things that Chris thought were important mm -hmm. about the story. And I don't think it would have been as interesting. I don't think it would have been as good a movie without that, that strange alchemy. There are things I would have completely missed and, and, and completely have gone over my head. I, I did not think that Gene was a part, a, a huge part of this story. Seth educated me uh, uh, intently, like this, he is, this has to go in. And, and, and yeah, and it was in the action part. Yeah. And Chris, it, the whole, you know, really making it about the childhood of so many 1980s kids was Chris, because Chris is a couple years older than me, and I think he understood that intuitively in a way that didn't come quite as immediately to me but once he once we start talking i understood and i think that that and that particularly i think is why this movie has struck an emotional chord for so many gen xers in particular is because they see their own latchkey childhood reflected in this movie in a way that i don't think they have in many places and that's all chris's brain right there yeah that's uh a beautiful partnership um, I, I could see that with you being inside of it and needing the outsider to yes. be able to draw out a more objective perspective. 100%. Yeah, literally, I've been living, I've been you know, forced through the trees. I've been swimming in this stuff, living in this so much that I, I, to some degree, I might have lost sight of why this is interesting to people who don't know the story. You know, yeah. what is it that if you're not already knee deep in the myth of Action Park, what is it that matters to you? And I think Chris, who was the outsider, came in with the fresh eyes and was like, this is what it's about. I think that was. Yeah, I'm like, Seth, we can't interview 40 people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a completist. <laughs> so, okay, so I know that uh, Seth, you wanted, uh, you wanted Mulva Hill in. Uh, Chris, you, you thought, you didn't understand the, the need for that at first. What was the situation that Chris, you saw needing to be in the movie that Seth, you might not have seen so much at first? It was the 80s, it was really the 80s stuff. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was uh, being, making about Latchkey Kid 80s existence and really making it about you know, the idea like you, you may not have gone to Action Park because you're not from the tri-state area, but you had your own Action Park if you grew up then. You swam in quarries or jumped off cliffs or broke into factories or gone to fights or whatever it is. You know, Action Park is, isn't this unique thing. It's a gated amusement park version of 1980s childhood. Is what mm. I think Chris really understood that. Yeah, that is profound. Yeah. You guys are kind of, uh, you guys have kind of become in my mind, at least, uh, some very uh, astute cultural analysts. Um, off the cuff question: What do you guys What do you guys think about the childhood that's happening under the cloud of our current events? I mean, what what happens to the kids who were, you know, ten, fifteen, or teenagers? The kids who are growing up formed by by this world. Chris, <laughs> you get the tough ones. <laughs> yeah. So when I hear of my my friends with kids. Hold on, there's a, a truck passing by. But when I hear of my friends with kids who are raising kids in this pandemic, they're isolated, they're quarantined to their homes, they don't know how the Zoom school works, they don't know if they're going to send their kids back to school. And preceding this, this era, parents were, 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 were hovering even more so, like monitoring where the kids were uh, watching, having play dates. Uh, mm. what, what were play dates? I don't, I, I don't see, and I don't want to sound like an old fogey, but I don't see kids having that sort of resilience, having that sort of um, scarring that they can, can take care of themselves when things in the world seems 
harmful and, and, and uncertain. Um, and I don't blame that on the parents. It's just at a time we live, live in this uncertainty right now, and especially trying to raise kids through a time like this, it's a very scary place. Um, and not to get very deep here, but I'm black. And my brothers have young children and they're young men. And this, the violence that we're seeing and just the, I, I hate that they're having to, to, to grow up in a place that seems so scary uh, that my brother has to teach his kids how to talk to cops that not to get killed. Um, it's just a weird time. In, in everyone's lives right now. And what I like about this film is that at least for 90 minutes, we could take you back to a time where things were simple and things did make sense. And there's an era that we could romanticize, even though there may not have been a lot of things to romanticize about. Yeah, even at the same time, you can do that. At the same time, say that is totally messed up. How was that ever able to exist? And that push and pull of nostalgia, I think is really important here. This idea that you can both look back at something romantically and also say, I'm really glad those days are behind us. Yeah. I think what the current time show or what your guys movie shows us too, is that you can come out of horrible situations or, you know, messed up situations um, stronger at the other end. And you can look back and reflect uh, with conflict, but you can still look back. At the very least. And also look back with humor. I mean, a lot of people who joke about Action Park are the people who went there and may have had horrific experiences there. Like there's a gallows humor to going to and surviving Action Park. And I think that we tend to look at humor as something that's only appropriate when things are, are light and not serious. But I think the very existence of humor is like an evolutionary trait, is, is a coping mechanism for when things are really harsh and really mm -hmm. hard. And I, and I love that kind of humor. And I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that kind of humor is okay. And it's okay sometimes to laugh at things that are terrible. Yeah, beautifully said, beautifully said. Um, I wanna go to audience questions now because I feel like I'm, I'm just uh, selfishly trying to talk all my ideas with you guys. Uh, and thank you for obliging this. Um, so just uh, to, to remind anybody out there watching, there's a little Q&A button at the bottom of the screen that you can type a question in, uh, and I will parrot it directly to Seth and Chris. Uh, and we got some good ones on here so far. Um, this one from anonymous attendee number seven. Uh, Andy Mulvihill's book about his father's park came out recently. Did he help or hinder your project? And how did his book differ from what you guys found to be the story? Oh, I'll handle that. Uh, the Mobile family had nothing to do with the production of our film. It would have been, I think, very difficult for us to make the movie we made had they. Uh, you know, I, I wanted Andy to sit for an interview for the movie because why wouldn't I? Uh, he declined to. I had some archival footage I shot of him seven years ago that we used and is clearly labeled as archival. Mm -hmm. uh, he neither helped nor hindered our project. He had nothing to do with it, to be honest. Um, you know, he, he has his own uh, project kind of in the works around Action Park. He's trying to, you know, he has a TV, uh, a scripted project set up um, and he has a book that came out, but he didn't help or hurt it. Um, you know, we, uh, I, I'd been in touch with him sporadically during the production, uh, but in the end he uh, declined to sit for an interview for the movie. And I think one can understand why. It is a very uh, democratic answer. Well done. <laughs> um, from Matt Warren, uh, he says, in talking about your film, have people come up to you to tell you about their own regional version of Action Park? Oh yeah, Chris, anything, what, what was your regional Action Park? Alex, what was your Action Park growing up? I grew up in Orange County, so I was around uh, like the, the quote unquote, like legitimate parks, like, uh, you know, like Disneyland and not, but I will say uh, not, Knott's Berry Farm used to have, and maybe they still do, they have this thing called Not Scary Farm that they do every Halloween the and um, they, they, they hire a ton of staff, like a ton of people who don't normally work there to basically run around the park, get dressed up and scare kids. Uh, and I have a lot of memories of those scares being something that like, I feel like a manager at a park wouldn't necessarily license. I feel like, I don't want to say anything bad about knots. I just feel like there were a lot of uh, risky behaviors going on with teenagers dressed up in costume. Yeah, I think everybody's had their own. I mean, actually, our uh, class action for Twitter, I threw out a tweet a couple days ago that was literally, 
what's your action bar growing up? And I said, I think I said like abandoned factories and quarries are acceptable answers. Uh, you know, so I think some people will give us the, like, oh yeah, this like shady water park or this amusement park. And then some people are like, oh yeah, that old farm we used to break into and tip cows and that, like that kind of stuff. And so I think everybody has their, their experience from that era. What about you, Chris? Um, we, uh, growing up in East Texas, each county had their own state fair. And so the, the, the fair would come into town with the jinky rides. There was this thing called the Gravitron that sucked you into the, the walls. Uh, I've done plenty of vomiting in the Gravitron, actually. It rolls up after the Gravitron. It goes right back on you. <laughs> yeah. And to this day, I don't know how that technology worked. Um, um, I think unsafely. I think it works unsafely. Unsafely so. And uh, you see the town drunk that they hired for the week working it um, and that was a bit of the, the, the action part for us. But we also, we had this pit, like this sulfur pit and um, they just stopped digging sulfur out of it. And it, I think they hit something and it turned into like a sulfur type lake that made awesome cliffs to jump off of. And so we would jump off of this, these cliffs and we would reek and it would get in your mouth and it was so bitter. We had no clue what we were jumping into, but like, to this day, I'm cancer free. <laughs> <laughs> yes. God. Well, good, good, good. Glad you didn't jump in too far. Yeah. Um, I got somebody asking about their specific uh, um, uh, action park. Have you guys come across something called Marshall Hall in the Washington DC area? I grew up in DC and I don't know about Marshall Hall. So it must have been uh, very cool. <laughs> like a little too cool for me, maybe. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, that one's a dud. Um, so, you know, this is for film independence. So we have a lot of uh, filmmakers that are watching. Um, and, you know, push me away if this is too personal a question. But one of these uh, on here from Alva asking uh, how you got funding uh, as fast as you guys did. From the chronology that you laid out, it seemed like it was about two months yeah, well, the answer is we didn't. Like, um, you know, we we just started rolling cameras, and uh, you know, we uh, we we put together a small crew and started rolling cameras, and uh, worried about that other kind of stuff later is really what we did. And um, so, no, like we we didn't. We just didn't. And and to piggyback on what Seth said, our small crew. Uh, you look at other documentaries, and it's like a crew of like fifty people. Our core group, what, less than 10? Seth? Yeah, most, most, of them. most of the people in the credits are like, you know, the kind of people at the post-production kind of like tuning things up, whatever else. But throughout most of the production, everything, it was like five people really total. Yeah. You know, me and Chris, our, our, and our DP um, is a film independent member, uh, Chris yeah. Johnson. And right, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I think he might be, yeah, I think he might be uh, um, yeah. on, on, on this, um, on this yeah. presentation, but wow. I presented this to Chris. Chris lives in Las Vegas, and Chris has this huge production van with all the gadgets and the, the, the top cameras. And I just went to Chris and was like, hey, man, we have this documentary we think is going to be amazing. And Chris trusted us and trusted the process. And we filmed in New – he drove that van from, from New Jersey. Oh, our whole yep. crew, him and, and our other DP, Rob, that was it. And we drove to New Jersey and we used the crew. Yeah. Yeah. In a yeah. week. Yeah. Wait, you guys shot all your interviews in a oh, week? Oh, no, no, no. There, there's caveats there. We, we, the, the, the initial stretch of them was basically a week and a half in the Tri-State area. And then we did some pickups later and whatnot. But yeah, most of this movie was shot a week and a half. Wow. How, how long did, you take, uh, did it take you guys to edit? A year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, it's always the lopsided deal. Yeah. <laughs> so. How much footage did you cut down from? Do you know how much, how much you compiled? Like oh, yeah. with the home videos? It was, uh, well, the interviews themselves were over 40 hours. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, we had a lot, a lot. And the home movies, we had a lot too, a lot. Uh, you know, it's, we have a lot. There's, there's, a, there's a B-side movie in there somewhere, you know? I'm sure, yeah. But, Do you but, guys but, have any plans to? Oh, go ahead. May I say this? Like, our crew, I got to give a shout out to our crew. Uh, Chris Wan, our first editor in, um, in Shreveport, Louisiana, 
who's edited a lot of my things. I say that I'm a good filmmaker, but with Chris Lyon, I'm an award-winning filmmaker. He is just an, um, an incredible talent. And Rob Senska, our B-roll photographer, he has been on every project that I've had. The guy just has a, a knack and an eye. And we, we did this lean, we did this mean, and we, we made a beautiful feature league documentary with a small crew. And dare I say that this is the way we move forward making movies um, during this pandemic and probably afterwards. But I believe that Action Park, uh, beyond its, its great critic reviews, is the uniqueness of this is how we produce this, how we shot this with a small crew and a, an incredibly talented crew. What's next for the crew? Do you guys have something lined up in the pipe? I mean, I, there's, there's only so much we can talk about right now, my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Very ominous. Very ominous. Oh, super ominous, yeah. Um, oh, let's see what else we got here. Well, frankly, I don't have any other, I don't have any other audience questions. Uh, and we got four more minutes. So we can just talk about whatever you guys want to talk about at this point. I want to build off something there. I think the only reason this kind of production was possible is because as a journalist who've been studying this topic for a decade, I came with everything already, like the sources, the archival, like the everything ready to roll. And I think what made our partnership so interesting of like journalists and filmmaker together is how that makes the production so efficient. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at like what kind of projects I wanna do, and I look at one of the big gaps that exists in the documentary world, to me, it's this chasm that exists between journalists and between the filmmaking world. Because I think journalists are some of the best storytellers, best researchers, have these access, have access often, have inroads into worlds. And they're just sitting there, most of them laid off right now. And if I was telling a documentary filmmaker, like, how do you go about telling a good story? Find a journalist, find a journalist who's got the inroads, who's got the sources, who's got the archival, who can like flip a switch and make that story happen. And that's who you work with, is what I would say. And I think what made our partnership so great is, is that journalism, like bringing those two things together. And it's something that I don't, I don't see happening much and I'm shocked I don't see it happening much. Yeah. Yeah, the trust, uh, when, when there were things that were like, I don't, eh, I always defer to Seth's journalism career and his background. I just always defer to it. Uh, and it, 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 it made a great movie. Um, but since we have some, so a few minutes, can I ask Seth a question? Oh, yeah, please do. Seth, what was your favorite story that was cut from the documentary? All right, so I, I, guess I got a lot, but one of my favorites uh, that, I, okay, so there's, a, there's like, the first part was cut, the second part I just learned about. So we briefly mentioned in the movie, a security guard talks about how he had heard that the owner of the park, Gene, kept a machine gun in his desk, a Mac-10 submachine gun. Um, the longer story, which was cut from the film because it just dragged on a little bit, was that he had actually broken into Gene's office to look for this machine gun with the intention of like shooting cans for fun. Like, and the idea being that if Gene uh, would never report this because it was an illegal gun in the first place. But when he got to Gene's office, the gun wasn't there. Well, what I only found out a couple weeks ago speaking to another Action Park employee was why that gun wasn't there. And that's that the other Action Park employee who I spoke to had the exact same idea and a couple weeks earlier had broken into Gene's office, found the gun, shot it for fun, and that in, those, in that period, Gene had, I suppose, realized that his desk drawer was not the best place to keep a machine gun. Jesus. <laughs> my God. And this is a park that's basically staffed by teenagers and kids, right? Who, who all know he has a machine gun and are literally breaking in to play with it. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like just the next ride that he would have come up with. Break into my office and shoot my machine gun. Machine gun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, um, I want to wrap it up by, uh, one, sharing a comment from Gary Bleemer saying uh, that he just wanted to tell you guys, as a Jersey boy born and raised in Rahway, this was the truest depiction of true Jerseyites in life in the 80s I've ever seen. Nice. So, Thank um, you. That is awesome. That's, that, we hear that and that... If we had gone it wrong, the whole state of New Jersey, just like somebody belly flopping off the Tarzan swing would have let us know. They would have- The stakes screamed. are high. Yeah. The stakes are high. <laughs> yeah, like the whole state of New Jersey would have been, yeah, you guys fucked up. Like, no, but uh, the response from locals, from Vernonites, from New Jersey, from people who work at the park has been 
o overwhelming and, and that, that is, you know, we're gratified, not because we made a movie designed to please people. This movie clearly doesn't please some people, but because if we had gotten it wrong, they would have let us know. Yeah. Well, it's a uh, well-deserved phrase. It's uh, an incredible movie, an insightful story, and a very interesting feeling to walk away from. Uh, it's on HBO Max right now, Class Action Park. Thank you so much, Seth and Chris, for sitting down with Film Independent. I hope you guys, uh, I hope that next ominous project is fantastic and that you're staying safe in these times. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. You guys are doing the Lord's work here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Thanks, man. If anybody wants to reach out to us and say hi, just like classactionpark at gmail.com, you know, cool. Say hi. Yeah. Say hi. Yeah, They're lovely hi. people to talk to. I can testify from first-hand experience. Sure. Thank you, guys.